So we're in our series on 2 Thessalonians. Last week, I covered chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And we went a different route. We talked about some different things, about the falling away, the coming Antichrist. I'm going to do that again today, but I'm going to go in a different direction to see what the Apostle Paul is actually trying to convey to the Thessalonians. Now, last week we did this in the New King James Version. This week we're going to do it in the New Living Translation to have a different, a couple of different things. So I'm going to read that right out of the box. We're going to put the scripture up on the screen for you, or you have your handouts. We're going to be in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12, and this is the New Living Translation this week. Paul trying to reassure the Thessalonians about something that they were really, really disturbed about. They thought that the rapture happened. They thought that they missed it. They thought the, the tribulation period had began and also that they, what do we do now? Well, they were believing a lie that was told to them. So Paul addresses that here today. So let's read this. It says, 2 Thessalonians 1 through 12. Now, dear brothers and sisters, Let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them. Even if they claim to have had a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us, don't be fooled by what they say. For that day will not come until there is a great rebellion, and most of your versions say a great falling away or an apostasy, against God, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God, claiming that he is himself, excuse me, he himself is God. Ultimate blasphemy. Don't you remember that I told you about all of this when I was with you? And you know that what is holding him back, for he can be revealed only when his time comes. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly, and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. I love that. This man will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those who fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. So God will cause them to be greatly deceived and they will believe these lies. Then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. You will never hear a progressive church preach anything close to that. So I'm going to break this down a little bit today. We're going to do it a little bit differently today. He starts out and says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. He says, Don't be so easily shaken and alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. As we discussed last week, there was a deceptive rumor circulating about the rapture that Paul wrote them in his first letter, 1 Thessalonians 4, about the catching away that we're going to meet the Lord in the air when he comes back for us. But they believe they missed this event, which, and they entered into the tribulation period and now had to deal with the Antichrist system. So they were terrified. So Paul writes this to say, no, 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 no. We're not in that yet. You haven't missed anything yet. So the Apostle Paul said, do not believe them, even if they claim to have a spiritual vision, a revelation, or even a letter from us. Don't be fooled by what they say. This is how you will know that the day will not come 
Okay, it will not come until the great rebellion or the falling away happens against God. And we see the prelude to that right now where there is a lot of people leaving the church, but they're not only leaving the church, they're leaving Jesus. But there are a lot of people coming to Jesus as well. And there are a lot of people coming back to Jesus in this time. So it's not all bad news. But we gotta see when the churches begin to thin out, what Jesus is doing is he's sifting his church and he's forming an end time remnant, those who are with him no matter what. That's what we're seeing right now. He's really putting together a bride without spot or wrinkle. That's what he's in the midst of doing right now. And that's some of the pressure or the sifting that we feel as people of God or believers of God. And then he says, um, uh, the man of lawlessness will be revealed, the one who brings destruction. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He wants to try to erase everything, scrub it, everything that is, has Christianity on the planet, everything that has Jesus on the planet, and he's going to rise himself up to be, I am the man, I am the Messiah. Christianity is a false religion, and there are people saying that right now. People of the World Economic Forum, okay? Uh, Klaus Schwab and uh, uh, Noah Harari, all these people in that organization, they're saying Christianity is a myth, Jesus is a myth. People who believe in this are stupid, okay? And these are people that try and make transhumanism real, part machine, part computer, part human being. These people are demonic, and what they want to do is reshape the world, and what they want to do is bring in a new humanistic philosophy, and that's exactly what the Antichrist is going to do. These people just have the spirit of the Antichrist that's influence in them, but we can see the prelude happening. And he will sit in the temple of God claiming that he himself is God. As I told our foundation class on Thursday night, the second temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, 40 years after Jesus ascended to heaven. They came in because there was such an uprising of Jewish rebellion against the Roman government. They were assassinating Roman soldiers. I mean, it was, it was tough. So Rome just sent everything to Jerusalem, said, go and destroy them. They destroyed the city. Over a million Jews were, were killed during that Roman insurgence. And they destroyed the city of Jerusalem, tore it to swim the rings, and tore that temple down. Every single stone and rock fulfilling what Jesus said in Matthew, Matthew chapter 24. So that's what happens. So there needs to be a third temple built. And right now, if you, those of you who are paying attention, there is plans on the board right now. They are ready to build it. They are ready to assume animal sacrifice like they did in the Old Testament. They want to do all these things to be able to start worshiping God in Israel because they have rejected Jesus the Messiah. They're still doubling down that Jesus is not the Messiah. And plans are in place to build that temple right now. And when that temple is built in Jerusalem, then it'll be set for this man of perdition to come and actually ascend himself in that temple, fulfilling Jesus' prophecy and what Paul is talking about here. But they will receive him as Messiah because he will bring peace against all their enemies. So they'll say, finally, he's the man. And then he will turn on them going into the second half of the tribulation, which is the great tribulation. And then it says he will attempt to turn the world's thinking away from Jesus and anything Christian and punish those who claim Jesus is God. And Paul says, don't you remember I told you about all these things when I was with you? Don't you know what is holding him back? For he can, only, for he can be revealed only when his time comes. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly, which means the powers of darkness in the heavenlies are already planning this big event. And evil people on the earth who are blind to the truth, big billionaires that want to control the world, they're just pawns of Satan, and they want to control the world. Satan's just using them to try to, you know, put this new world order in place. So the plans are in place. That's what it says. It's already at work. And what will happen is the only thing holding him back, he says when he is holding him back is taken out of the way, then this man will be revealed. What is holding him back? It's either the Holy Spirit's restraining power or it's the Spirit-filled church on the earth that is holding him back. And when that's lifted or taken out of here, then there's nothing to keep him from coming. Either way, it is God holding him back. Now, when this happens, it doesn't mean the Holy Spirit's gonna leave the earth. Or leave the world. 
He's God. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. So he's still going to be here. It's just the restraining power that's saying, Satan, your time is not now. He can't, he can't usurp that powerful overlording authority of the, of the Lord. He can't. But when he does this, then that's when he's going to come on the scene. And I truly believe that's when we get taken out of here. I don't even believe we're going to see who he is. I don't believe that as a church. So this is what Paul is saying here, right there. And he begins to tell these people that, listen, you're being persecuted so much right now that you think you've missed the rapture and God calling you away, and you think that you're in the great tribulation now. What you're dealing with in persecution is child's play compared to what's coming in that hour. So don't think that you don't believe any reports you've heard. Stand strong and walk with your God day by day. So my friends, when we're considering, as I just read this to you and explained it a little bit, when we're considering any questions involving what's called eschatology, eschatology is basically the study of end times or the end of all things or the end of days. And it's important to remember that most all Christians will agree when it comes to those things on three things. No matter where you come, they agree on three things. There is a coming time in this world called the tribulation period and then the great tribulation after that. It's three and a half years of tribulation and then another three and a half years of great tribulation. A seven year period. So, so bad, so wicked, so dark, so evil, so painful. The world has never seen a time like this and Jesus said that in Matthew 24. The second thing they all agree on is there is gonna be a seven year tribulation period and Jesus will return to establish his kingdom on this earth. And the third thing, that there will be a rapture or a catching away of the true church. And our mortal bodies that we have right now will basically be transformed in an instant into heavenly bodies. And those who are in their graves right now will be resurrected before that happens. And their soul and spirit, which is with Jesus right now, will return to those glorified bodies and there will be new glorified be beings fit for heaven. And we'll all be caught up with the Lord together and we will be with the Lord forever. Everybody believes in that. The only difference is it's all timing. Where the disagreement comes in is timing. When will this happen? When will this happen in conjunction with the tribulation period on the earth? That's where kind of differences come in. So there are three primary positions I want to talk to you about as far as the rapture or the calling away when Jesus returns. And these are the three dominant ones. Now there are more than this, but these are the three dominant positions that you will hear. You'll see this on the back of your handouts. Number one is the post-tribulation rapture. Post-tribulation rapture. The church will go through the great tribulation. This is a belief system that some, some Christians have. Now the post-tribulation rapture's view, or its position actually, it teaches that the rapture occurs at the end or near the end of the great tribulation period. At that time, the church will be caught up in the air to be with Jesus. And then they will basically just turn around and come back to the earth with him when he comes to the earth to set up his kingdom. It's simultaneous, it's all pretty much one event. According to this view, the church goes through this entire seven year tribulation and God gives them a special grace to go through it. The Roman Catholic Church believes this, the Greek Orthodox Church believes this, and many other Protestant denominations hold this view as well. But it's mainly because in Matthew 24, Jesus talked about the time that was coming to his disciples at the end of the world at his return, and there were Christians actually living in the tribulation period when Jesus was telling the story in Matthew chapter 24. So that's where some of this belief system comes from. The worst time that has ever come on the earth, it's coming. And it's under this demonic world leader. But they interpret other passages, mainly in Revelation, incorrectly, I believe. The Christians living during this tribulation period that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 24, he was either talking about literal Israelites or Jews that will be there at that time because that's where he was. He was talking about the Israelites and Jerusalem being, you know, destroyed by all the stones coming down the temple. So it could have been Israelites that will be in the land or it could be those Christians who got saved during the tribulation. There will be Christians during the tribulation who come and get saved. Either way, 
uh, the post-tribulation people believe that the whole church will go through this. And I'm gonna show you as I wrap this up today how I don't believe that that's what we're gonna go through. But anyways, that's their position. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But the second one is the mid-tribulation rapture. The mid-tribulation rapture, the church will be taken out before the second half of the tribulation, which is the great tribulation. So mid-tribulation position teaches that the rapture occurs midpoint of the tribulation. And at that time, what's called the seventh trumpet in Revelation 11, 15, the church will meet Christ in the air and then there's a thing called the bold judgments that will be poured out on the earth. And that's in Revelation 15, 16. And the second of the three and a half years of the great tribulation, we're gonna miss that. God will call us out before it gets really, really bad. That's their position. We're spared from the worst of it, but another view is the pre-wrath position. Pre-wrath and mid-tribulation is basically the same thing. But what happens is, then we'll get caught up with the Lord in the air, we'll hang out with him someplace for three and a half years, and then we'll come back with him. So when the Lord pours out his wrath in the earth, the church will not feel that. It will just feel the beginning of it. But there are some issues with this view, mostly found in the book of Revelation. And there's mostly it's timing. It's inconsistent with what Revelation teaches. So when you put the whole Bible together, this position doesn't really hold. But the third one is what is predominant in the church, believe it or not. It is the pre-tribulation rapture, number three. The church will be taken out before the Antichrist comes to reign. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18, which I taught you on when we did the 1 Thessalonians series, is reassuring the confused and anxious Thessalonians about what Paul told them. He said, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be informed uninformed about those who sleep. Now, they thought their dead relatives were, will never go to heaven. No, 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 they're gonna be raised, Paul said, and they're gonna be raised incorruptible in their spirits and souls, which are with Jesus now. That's the real you, by the way. That's the real me. You have a soul and you have a spirit. You're three parts, you have a, you have a, you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. Some people, that's called a trichotomy. Some people believe in a dichotomy, that the soul and spirit are the same thing. You know what? I don't believe that, but that, those are secondary issues. But God made us three parts. And what's gonna happen is when a person dies, their body stays here. But the real you, the soul and the spirit, that's what goes to be either with Jesus or it goes to, it goes to Hades. Hades is just a temporary prison, holding tank, until the great white throne judgment. That's a whole other teaching and a whole other thing. You go one or two places. You either believe that or you don't, but the Bible teaches that, and that's what I believe. So what happens is that soul and spirit, the, your soul is the part of you that transforms. Your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions, your personality, your, your likes, your dislikes, your talents, your gifts. Those are all part of your soul that makes you unique. Your spirit is your, for lack of better words, ghost. That is the part that Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit has resurrected to new life. Because our spirit was kind of dormant, limp, dead because of sin. But the Holy Spirit resurrects it to new life. And to give you a, a picture, we kind of marry with the Holy Spirit. And when you look at Galatians chapter five, we have a desire, we want to do right. We want to worship God. We want to pray. We don't want to sin. We want to, we want to walk with God, learn with God, love God. We want to do the will of God. That's your spirit because it's been resurrected to new life. Your body wants to do everything opposite of that. I want to sin. I want to be selfish. I want to have my way. I want to do this. So Galatians 5 talks about the spiritual war between the spirit and the flesh of the carnal man. In the middle is the tiebreaker. That's your soul. That's your mind, your will, your emotions, your intellect. That's the thing that gets renewed to think differently, to think like God, to be able to transform and want to serve God more, understand God more. This is the intellect part that we need to transform. Doesn't Romans chapter 12 says that in order to know the will of God, we must be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Our mind needs to think differently like God. 
And as we put the word of God in it, as we hear preaching, as we walk it out, as we battle temptation, we begin to think different, we walk different, our soul is being transformed into the image of God. Your spirit is ready to go with God right away. That doesn't have to change. It's been resurrected to new life. Your body, you know, it's gonna die one day and it can die all at once. I want my new body. I want my new resurrected body. So anyways, that's kind of who you are. That's who you are. And that's gonna be all a brand new resurrected spiritual being at the rapture. So I love that. So that, that's not my notes. I just figured I'd throw that in there. But anyways, what I wanna to get to is in the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is, is, is a teaching on end time events and the return of the Lord and the judgments of God on the earth. And the pre-tribulation rapture is the predominant teaching of the belief system in this. Now there is a teaching that says, well, the pre-tribulation rapture only came out in the mid 1800s. The mid 1800s, this guy came up with this idea and began to teach it. No, it got revitalized in the mid 1800s. The early church believed this and early church writers who wrote about history, Christian history in the first and second century, they believed in this as well. You just don't hear about those things. So the pre-tribulation position like others is a position and basically which draws from the book of Daniel, the book of, G I mean, Jesus teaching, the, the Apostle Paul, the book of Revelation, a few other places. And the pre-tribulation view seems to be the most consistent one with God's character. He desires to deliver the righteous from judgment and the condemnation from what's coming in the world. Now, the biblical examples of God's salvation like this includes Noah. It includes Lot. He was delivered from Sodom and Gomorrah as Noah, as Noah was delivered from the flood. Also Rahab, who was delivered from Jericho before they destroyed Jericho. But one thing we all need to remember about these positions as Christians and end times, they have nothing to do with your salvation. They're all secondary issues. If you don't agree in these issues, because everybody will make a theological point about what they believe. But we need to understand, we need to strive and love together as a church family. And what happens is sometimes we see these nasty comments on social media. When people have one theological end time view, ah, there's no such thing as a rapture, and they get really nasty. So do you have to be so nasty? Can't we just disagree on this? It's secondary. It has nothing to do with your salvation with Jesus. Nothing at all with that, okay? Because what happens is if you are a forgiven sinner and you are now washed, cleansed by the blood of Christ, adopted by the fa Father into his family, that's what matters. Who is Jesus? Who is he? Is he my Lord, Savior, and God, and there is no other? That is primary. That is not secondary. So we've got to get that right. If it's, a, if it's a dartboard, that red center, that's Jesus. We've got to believe that him, the Trinity, he's coming again. He came once and he's coming again. And he died for my sins and he sent the Holy Spirit to resurrect me to new life and to adopt me into his family. And if you've got to believe that, that's basically the, the center that we have to believe. And many denominations around the world that differ, they've got to believe in that at least. So... So anyways, these secondary issues just divide people and it really shouldn't. Christians need to learn to chill out when they disagree on secondary issues and walk in love towards one another and avoid these arguments that people have about this stuff. So anyways, what I wanna do right now is make you understand that these end time events, that's God's job. He is planning them out exactly how it's gonna lay out. But Jesus gave us signs to look for and the apostles gave us lion signs to look for, and the times we're living in, I believe, it could be very soon. So what I want to do right now is I want to present to you my position on the pre-tribulation rapture. And most of you know where I stand anyways about this and the return of Jesus, but the book of Revelation talks about the end times and what it's going to be like. When God begins to pour his judgment upon this world, this is what's going to be like. Now, these are a breakdown of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is sometimes it's hard to understand. It's 22 chapters about the end of time and what will be when we enjoy Jesus for eternity.
Just as the book of Genesis is, is all about the beginnings of everything, Revelation is about the end of everything. Now, what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to, this, this is the great events of the great tribulation. I'm going to break down Revelation to you in a nutshell so you can understand what it's talking about. Now, note, out of the 22 chapters in this book, from chapters 4 to 19, this is where all the judgments being poured out. And then there'll be a great white throne judgment when Jesus returns in Revelation 20. And this, all those outside of Christ will stand before him and be judged for their sins and be cast into a lake of fire to the degree of the sin they did on the earth. That's called the books are opened and the books of their life are read. Listen, I know this isn't pretty, but this is what it says. What are we saved from? When you get saved, what are we saved from? We're saved from a lot. That's God's mercy. Now listen to this. Now, what I'm about to read to you, if you want a copy of this, it's right here. You can come down and grab one off the table if you want to take one home. But I'm going to read you. Now note, the book of Revelation from chapter 4 to chapter 19 is the judgments being poured out on the Antichrist when he comes and everything in this world, what's going to happen. After chapter 3, Chapter 3, what happens is the church is mentioned 19 times in three chapters. After chapter 3, you don't hear of the church anymore. It's out of the picture. That's why we believe they've been taken away before wrath has been poured out. So we're going to start. Revelation chapter 4. Just listen to this as I read this. This is the book of Revelation of what's coming on this earth. Revelation 4. John was a symbol of the church, the apostle John, and he was taken up into heaven and he received this vision. Now in Daniel chapter nine, in the Old Testament, the Antichrist signs a covenant for seven years with the nation of Israel, okay? They're deceived in thinking he's the Messiah. This is the event that inaugurates the tribulation period. Revelation six, Christ opens the first of seven seals, scrolls, and the rider on the white horse, probably the Antichrist, appears using diplomacy. And he's a slick talker, and he promises peace to establish his one world government. Then the second seal introduces a great world war. We're still in Revelation 6. The third seal begins in the suffering of famine and inflation after the aftermath of that war. Then in Revelation 6, the fourth seal results, as do all wars in death. But in this case, it totals one-fourth of the people, all living creatures on the earth. By today's population standards, that would be about 1.3, no, one, almost 2 billion people. One and three-quarter billion people will die from that first war. Revelation 6 continues, this passage introduces the martyrdom of those who are converted under the preaching of 144,000 Jewish witnesses described in chapters 7 and 14 of Revelation. An innumerable number of people receive Christ and are martyred by the government leader and the harlot, the religious system described in Revelation 17, who gets her power from the Antichrist. Now that, note that the evangelism during this period is back in the hands of the Jews, not the church. Because when the Jews find out this is not our Messiah, God's gonna raise up 144,000 on fire Jewish people who accept Christ and they become unbelievable evangelists but they're gonna be under so much persecution. But God's gonna protect them though. And the word of God's gonna go out and many will get saved during this horrible period. Since the church is absent, the 144,000 Apostle Paul type believers will make powerful evangelists. Revelation six continues, the sixth seal exhibits the wrath of God being poured out in the form of a mighty earthquake. The, the like which has never been experienced on earth. It is so severe that people call for rocks to fall down on them. Then it moves to Revelation 8. The seventh seal introduces the seventh trumpet judgments, ending in the first quarter of the tribulation period and preparing for an event worse, so bad, that it's called the day of God's wrath. Revelation 8 continues, the first trumpet judgment results in one third of all the trees and green grass being burned up by hail, fire, and blood cast on the earth. 
The second trumpet sees the great mountain of sulfur falling into the sea and destroying a third part of the sea and all living creatures in it and a third of the shipping vessels. Think about the Poseidon adventure in times 100. All these ships are just turned over. All these people die at sea when this happens. And then Revelation 8, the third trumpet causes the great star, probably a mediator, a medio, excuse me, a medio, called wormwood or bitter, to fall on the fountains of water, and third of the waters become bitter on the earth, resulting in millions of deaths. Revelation 8 continues, the fourth trumpet results in one-third less sun, moonlight, and stars, extending the darkness of night. A special angel flies around the earth, warning that worse judgments are still to come. Revelation 9, the fifth trumpet introduces hideous demon-like creatures, such as scorpions and locusts, out of the bottomless pit. Not able to kill men, but they will torture them so badly that they will seek death and will not find it. Then it moves to Revelation chapter 9. The sixth trumpet introduces 200 million horsemen. These are demon-like creatures who will kill one-third of the people. They will occur between the 40th and 42nd month of the first part of the tribulation, which brings to 50% of the population that is destroyed by God before the midpoint of the tribulation. These individuals have taken the mark of the beast and are considered worshipers of the beast and Satan. Since estimates of upward of a quarter of those living at that time will still be saved under the preaching of the 144,000 Jewish witnesses mentioned in Revelation 7. It is possible that 75% of the world's population, 25% will be martyred. They will have been destroyed during the first half of the tribulation period. Now do you understand why I say that even a mid-tribulation view of Christ coming for his church would mean enormous suffering for millions of believers. It seems much more reasonable, particularly in the light of his promise to save his church from the wrath to come, that he would have his church from the hour of trial, which is coming upon this whole world. That would certainly be characteristic of our loving, merciful, forgiving Heavenly Father and our bridegroom, Jesus Christ. The Christians who are martyred during the tribulation are not part of the current church. They are defined in Revelation 7 as the ones who come out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the Lamb's blood. Revelation 11, the two witnesses prophesy a 1260 days, a ministry which literally will correspond with the 42 months or the three and a half years already described. Obviously, these two witnesses are real people with miraculous powers like Moses and Elijah, here to preach and witness during the entire first half of the tribulation. We haven't even got to the great tribulation yet. This is just the tribulation. As dreadful as this time will be, God is faithful to provide plenty of gospel preaching to these nations. And in Revelation 11, the seventh trump, trumpet judgment introduces the awesome events described in 12 and, uh, chapters 12 to 18, and the most severe set of judgments yet reported, the vile judgments. The vile judgments in Revelation 17. It describes the, the destruction of the Babylonian-ish religious system Satan has set up on the earth, which will merge with all religions on the earth during the first part of the tribulation, which will take place easily after the church is raptured. This system will be so powerful that it will dominate both the Antichrist, the Beast, and the Ten king, uh, Kings at the time. But because of their hatred for the harlot at the midpoint of the tribulation, they will make more on her and kill her. Revelation 13, in the process of killing the harlot, Mystery Babylon, the false religious system, somehow the Antichrist gets killed, and it's a deadly wound, but it is miraculously healed and everybody will accept him as a miraculous Messiah. Chapter 12, Satan himself is cast down from heaven, and he has been the accuser of our brethren. He now enters the Antichrist body and resurrects him to new life, and even more vicious. Revelation 13, I'm almost done. Revelation 13, the Antichrist is now incarnate with Satan, Satan himself. He will force the remaining people of the earth to worship him, except those names in the Lamb's Book of Life. 
The false prophet will replace the slain religious system. This is a propaganda machine. Forcing people to worship the Antichrist in his image or be killed. Everyone will comp com be compelled to display the 666 mark on their forehead or their hands, either to hold a job, to buy, or to do anything on the earth with commerce. Plainly, if the church were going to go through the tribulation, she would not survive it. And if, and I find no scriptural evidence that any believers will remain at the end of the tribulation will even be raptured. If that event is post-trib, it doesn't make any sense. Remember, the worst half of the tribulation period, which our Lord termed the Great Tribulation, hasn't even begun yet. The last 42 months period is covered with the vile judgments. Starting in Revelation 16, the first vial becomes giant sores on those who reject Christ, and instead of accepting the mark of the beast, signifying their worship to him. Revelation 16 continues, the second vial is poured out on the sea, turning it to blood as a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Revelation 16 continues, the third vial turns the rivers in sources of water to blood, especially just judgment because the people remaining had killed so many tribulation Christians. Then the fourth vial will intensify the sun's heat until ungodly men blaspheme the name of God. The fifth vial will cause darkness to cover the throne of the Antichrist and his entire kingdom. The sores will continue unrelentingly, producing such agony that men will gnaw their tongues for pain and blasphemy God and refuse to repent the sixth vial sends flying demon spirits out to the kings of the earth to bring them down to the battle of the great day of the Lord. This is known as the Battle of Armageddon. And the seventh seal uh, sin results in Almighty God destroys the whole world system and judges all unsaved men severely. But even though enormous hailstones fall, the ungenerate still refuse to repent. This judgment is so devastating that it prepares the world for the coming of the Lord to set up his earthly kingdom. Revelation 18, the destruction of the commercial and governmental ba Babylon, the new world order for which man has yearned for since his rebellion before the earth's final judgment. It totally collapses the antichrist system and further paves way for the best event of the great tribulation. Revelation 19, we finally witness the glorious appearing of Jesus and the power and great glory, the King of kings and Lord of lords, to come and set up his kingdom to judge everything on the earth. And we who are with him in heaven will come back with him because we've been raptured. That is a layman's look at the book of Revelation of what's coming on this earth. I don't believe it's consistent with our Heavenly Father to allow his blood-bought, redeemed people to go through something like that. I don't believe that at all. I don't see that consistent with what the Bible teaches. Now I'm going to end with this tonight, today. Look on the back of your handouts. The wrath of God poured out at the end of the world is not for the church. These are just some basic scriptures. Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. People just double down and refuse, I don't need Jesus. Why is the wrath of God coming and being revealed from heaven? It's against all godliness and wickedness, not the church. Number two, 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. This is where the Thessalonians turned from their pagan worship and they embraced Jesus Christ. They tell you how you've turned from God, to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from what? The wrath to come. Revelation 3, 9 and 10. Jesus says, I will make them, but this is the last time the church is found in the book of Revelation before the judges, for the judgments, Revelation 3. Jesus says, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Jesus said, I'm going to keep you from that. 
Romans 5, 8 and 9. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, that means like you never sinned. That's what justification is. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Saved from God's wrath. Lastly, Romans 2, 5 through 11. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. This is a warning to the Romans to receive Christ and walk with him. Don't be stubborn. When his righteous judgment is revealed, God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who have, by persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking, who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew and then the Gentile. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. I have just given you a little bit about why I have the position of a pre-tribulation rapture. I believe that's consistent with God's heart, with the Bible, as he delivered Noah out of, the, out of the way before the destruction came on the ark, as he delivered Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah before he rained hailstone and fire down on that wicked city. And there's other things that God did to deliver his people for judgment. Jesus talked about, when I come back, it's gonna be like the days of Noah, the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what you look for. God delivered his people out before judgment came. What I'm saying is, Christians need to fly right in this hour. Because Jesus said, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of God, but only those who do the will of my Father. There's many Christians that, they're basically not really tied in. Who are those people? I don't know, he knows. But all I know is we have to always examine our lives and make sure that we're walking close with Jesus. Because when that rapture happens and we miss it, there's no, no turning back. But I would say this, I don't say that to scare you, I say that to prepare you. It's just so we can be prepared. And there are other pastors preaching this way. The only reason I'm preaching this way is because we're in 2 Thessalonians, and that's the subject matter. That's why I'm teaching it, okay? But can I ask you a question? Is this sobering? This is an extremely sobering message. This is what Paul told them. This is what you're going to escape. So don't, you're, going, you're going through persecution right now, but don't wig out. You haven't missed anything. Stand strong, walk with your God. I'm proud of you, Jesus is proud of you. Just continue to walk with him faithfully. And you know what? We will never do it perfectly, but we walk with him faithfully. And when we, before we know it, we're gonna be changed that quick. I love that. That could be 100 years away or it could be 10 days away, I don't know. But make sure that we're faithful and walk with our God in the days we're walking in, and to train our children to walk that way as well. So anyways, the horror movie's over, okay? Let me pray a blessing on you, okay? Hey, Lord, I want to thank you and praise you for the strong messages that Jesus and the Apostle Paul gave us in the Scriptures. So many churches who are trying to put people in the seats will not even touch these things, and people are so unprepared for the times we live in. But Lord, we want to be here to be loving and kind, but we also want to walk in truth to preach what the Bible teaches, so we can always be walking with our God closely, not living in fear, but living in faith, understanding that the days we live in are evil, and we have to be just walking with Jesus understanding that we don't want to be deceived. We are people who love the truth, we want to walk in the truth, and we want to learn more about the truth because that's who we are as spirit-filled, redeemed people. I pray your blessing of peace over your people right now as we are living in days that are very uncertain, very dark, 
And Lord, who knows? Maybe your time is coming. Maybe the man of perdition, the, the, the world leader, is coming on the scene soon. We don't know. But Lord, he could be 50 years away. He could be five days away. But I believe that as we walk day by day with our God, we don't have to walk in fear. We have to walk in faith and keep our eyes open to realize that we need to be on cutting edge in the days we live in. The political systems of this world are not our savior. They are not our answer. The answer is Jesus Christ and for cultures to come to Jesus. And that's what changes the culture. So Lord, we declare you to be king. We declare you to be awesome and glorious. And we thank you, Lord, that we are gonna rule and reign with you in a thousand years when you come back. And we thank you for the positions you're gonna give us in that kingdom. And you're gonna, you're gonna determine those positions based on our works now. Our works don't save us, but they will determine the rewards and positions we receive in that new kingdom. So Lord, help us to be faithful. So I bless your people with peace, not to be afraid, but to be aware of the times we live in. We love you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.